Hello and welcome to Unsourced Wall. My name is Elvis and as always I am your host. All right, so let's get into this. It's a pretty standard week. Some news, a lot of new releases, and some listener questions. Plus what I watched this week, which still only boils down to Titans, but is there really anything else worth watching? Let's move on in straight on to movie news. Perhaps one of the most exciting, if it actually is true, which it might not be, has to be that Thomas Hayden Church, who has been cast in the new Hellboy movie, his role has been rumored to be Lobster Johnson, which is fantastic. Thomas Hayden Church has that amazing voice and a really entertaining to watch presence. He could do really great stuff with that. In fact, the whole thing with the leaked trailer looking like crap and all the clips that come out looking terrible. If that turns out to be true, that might be like the only reason I watched this movie. Just the Thomas Hayden Church as Lobster Johnson because nothing else about this movie looks like it's going to be entertaining. I would go as far as to say that I would wish in some miracle instance that this movie just gets scrapped and we just make a Lobster Johnson movie. That would be amazing solely on its own. That's perfect. That's pitch perfect. Everything else though is pretty lackluster. And the only other thing of interest so far this week has been that we have new details on Kingsman 3 with Matthew Vaughn returning as director slash writer. An interesting tidbit is that it started being announced and spread around the news wheel this week that Taron Egerton, who played Eggsy, the main character in the first two, will not be returning for the third movie. And that led a lot of people to, I guess, jump on the wagon and start saying that this franchise is dead or that the second one was so bad that they now need to take a turn and to refresh tracks and do a soft reboot. That's not the case at all. Although with the perception that second one got, I'm not surprised that that's a guess. What is the case though is that the third movie is actually going to be a prequel. I'm guessing focusing on Colin Firth's character, Harry Hart. And the original plan for this was that the prequel and the final movie would film back to back. And that one would tie up Taron Egerton's character and narrative arc. Except that Taron Egerton has kind of blown up in popularity and in exposure in the last couple of years. A lot of biopics and a lot of character pieces and all that kind of stuff, which honestly, good for him. I think he's a really talented actor and I can't wait to see him in like Rocket Man. And I really enjoyed Eddie the Eagle. So... Yeah, he's been around and his schedule prevents that whole back-to-back shooting idea from coming to fruition. Although now that it can't shoot back-to-back, a lot of this is dependent on a prequel, which people might not take all that seriously because the second movie did not engender the fans a lot more. I enjoyed the second movie for what it was. I thought it was marginally better than the original because I wasn't that enthusiastic about the original movie. But I thought the sequel did a lot of things that were at least entertaining more in their own way. But again, a lot of people didn't feel that way. A lot of people felt it was a huge step down. So who knows how this people will do. If it doesn't do well, then that entire plan is shot. So I'm guessing that, yeah, now the franchise really is in shaky water. It dares a lot. I think that there was an incline, that there was some progression in terms of the stuff that I really enjoyed. And I'm a little bit more hopeful for the prequel, but hopefully it takes advantage of the fact that it is removed. Wishing all the best on the production, and I can't wait to see what actually does get thought up as details continue to come in. Anyway, onward to TV news, there is something that I don't think anyone really expected, and that's that Grant Morrison's comic book series The Invisibles is getting a television adaptation produced, and I'm guessing written by him as well. It's from the same production company that is doing Happy for sci-fi. Grant Morrison and them have signed a new deal and it's going to be him helming the Invisible show and I believe a new adaptation of Brave New World and all that. But Invisibles is the most unexpected thing because that is a tall order. I'm not the kind of person who's like, this thing is unfilmable or this thing could never work in an intermedium. But the Invisibles, that is asking for a lot. Not only is it so pinpointed in a specific time and place and setting and emotion and feeling, but it does so in a very self-indulgent way. You know, if you know the history behind the comic, then this isn't going to surprise you, but it's common knowledge that Grant Morrison used that comic in order to, like, influence his own aesthetic, his own personality through, like, semi-pseudo-cult means. And he poured a lot of himself and his own intimate filters through it. That's going to be a lot of things that you have to take in mind when trying to translate that into something that can have at least a more broad appeal in terms like a television landscape. But again, you might say like this is a company that did Happy and Happy itself was a very weird comic and it became a weirder show. The show itself is insanely more weird than the comic, but Invisible is 
just keeps going back and forth and it grows exponentially into itself it is on a whole different level best of luck to them I don't know where they're going to be able to find a King Mob actor that is going to be able to embody someone who is so Grant Morrison, or at least what Grant Morrison wishes. That's going to be a trip. So fingers crossed for them. And just to give a small update on a previous news segment, the Church of Satan has officially started suing the Chilean Adventure Sabrina over their use of the Baphomet design. And I'm still just cracking up about that. It's amazing. I did not expect that. But in hindsight, it makes complete sense, and I just don't know how anyone who worked on that show in that kind of position that would need to be able to be cognizant about the source of risks and all that wouldn't be able to see this coming. I mean, it's hilarious. It's great. It's great. It's great. I wish both sides the best. I don't know who I want to come out on top on this, but whoever wins, we win too. It's, it's great. And the last TV news has to come from the Swamp Thing show. We have a whole slew of casting announcements. Alec Holland has been cast by Andy Bean, who I do not recognize anywhere. I don't want to be too hard on Andy Bean. Like I said when I reviewed the original movie, Ray Wise, I didn't really see him as Alec Holland either, but he did a fantastic job. So fingers crossed and best wishes to Andy Bean. This show, I think, really has a lot of potential. Hopefully it'll turn out great. Fingers crossed. I'm really excited for this show. I think that with Titans turning out to be pretty decent overall and Do Patrol, their backdoor pilot and all the stuff about their main show sounding really strong. I just want this to continue that trend of being genuine quality. Another interesting bit of news is that there is this heavy rumor that Jeremy Irons has been cast in the Watchmen TV show as the older version of Ozymandias, which would be fantastic casting, no doubt. But as of right now, it's nothing that's kind of substantiated. So just a heavy rumor. It's take a grain of salt type stuff. But it would be really exciting, wouldn't it? Because as we know that the story is going to be centered around these comps stumbling on this kind of conspiracy involving the main Watchmen plot couple of decades into the future in our present i guess having an older ozymandias would be the logical avenue to take if you want to use that as your backdrop and this is just my guessing right now but maybe the plot could center around ozymandias and the cops doing sort of back and forth like a reverse cat and mouse type thing for a lot of intrigue and you can get a lot of drama and suspense and tension out of that trying to be optimistic about this because it does have a lot more leeway and as long as they keep to some sort of conventional genre structure they should be fine anyway that's it for television news let's move on to comic news and the first and foremost one has to be that dc is once again reshifting and refocusing the aims of their black label imprint thus really negating the entire point of it the most egregious thing is that it is now being used to shuffle off all of their evergreen and moderately successful minis and one shots and single graphic novel stories all-star Superman and Watchmen and the Dark Knight series which is just hilarious it's great it's great this was originally pitched as sort of the max imprint analog for DC where creators could tell like adult level stories and not have to worry about the constraints but now that's just shot Black Label is now just the standard evergreen imprint for modern classics it's ridiculous, really, isn't it? It's, it's ridiculous, but it's also just hilarious because now we're just getting whatever the hell they want to reprint just to get people to double dip. On their list of titles that they're trying to pry over to Black Label, it seems we're going to get another reprinting of All-Star Batman and Robin. Still called All-Star Batman and Robin Volume 1. I mean, if you're still going to call that Volume 1, then please, for the love of gods, DC, release Volume 2. Anyway, I digress. That's it for comic news this week. Thank you for that. And finally, we can move on into what I read this week because, well, I do have some strong feelings, positive and really, really negative about some stuff that I'm just itching to get out. First of all, to just do something that I forgot last week, Heroes in Christ number two terrible. All right, now let's move on to something a little bit more substantial. We have The Wrong Earth number three from Tom Payer and Jamal Eagle from Ahoy Comics. Honestly, I have really been enjoying this series. It's it's just so great. And it's great in that very simplistic, down-to-earth, stripped-down, very basic sort of way. Like, it's no frills. It's everything that you want this kind of story to be. It's conventional, but it's homey, and it's comfortable, and it's just entertaining read. I am loving the set pieces for both Dragonflies, Dragon fly man and the dragonfly as they try to travail and traverse their respective new universes i think that 
it knows exactly what buttons to push in order to show the real definite contrast. These really high, shrill dissonance that really cut at you. Like when Giant Fly Man figures out the fate of the Darker Universe's version of Stinger. That moment is so present because the first two issues have done so much to try and hammer down the innocence and the relative naivety of Giant Fly Man. So even if it just gets a couple of lines, one back or forth of dialogue in one panel, it is just so incise. And I love it. With the dragonfly on the more cheery, more campier, you see him trying to go, you know, roundabout back and forth and trying to deal with it. It's a little bit weaker, I think, mainly because it feels a lot more bare bones, but it's still just really entertaining. I think that his gruffness, it carries a lot of the attitude and the atmosphere. They all make it work. I think one of my favorite pieces of this issue is that we see one half of the villainous duo, the number ones, the campier one, just dropped like a dead fly. He is completely murked and it is honestly very shocking in that way because from what we see of that number one, he's just harmless villain and so i really enjoy this series i can't wait to see where it goes and hopefully even when this main story ends we get to see more of these characters because right now i'm getting pretty attached to them no lie all right next up would have to be sideways annual number one this one is the highly anticipated return of the new 52 superman and it has as a guest writer Grant Morrison. So I think that this was always the crown jewel in the eyes of people waiting for this Seven Soldiers Dark Multiverse arc. Just as soon as that was announced and that Grant Morrison would be collaborating and when this cover was first shown like a couple months ago, people were really excited about it. I was really excited about it. And I just want to talk about this arc in general for a while before I get into this issue because it does bear just a little bit more dissection, just a little overview because I don't think you can really talk about this issue as the ending of this arc without talking about the arc as a whole. And Honestly, the Dark Multiverse arc has been very lackluster. I think that it was overall very muddy, very messy, and it just didn't have a good head on its shoulders. It didn't know what exactly it wanted to do, and if it did, it had no idea how to coordinate that or how to really showcase any of the themes it wants to play with to the reader. So it just comes off looking very chaotic and not in a good way. I think that the most hitting and most hearty parts of this arc has to be the ones that were centered around Derek's mother's death and how people are responding to that. My favorite parts being Derek's immediate response to that, to that event and the funeral, which he's not present at. But everything regarding Seven Soldiers, due to the strength of all that and due to their relative like lack of momentum in the arc itself because they appear in 1% of the arc overall. It was pretty disappointing. All that just can't help but feel like a detour from the main storyline, which it sort of is, but it feels so jarring and just not welcome. And then when you get to the meat of the arc as a whole, the whole stuff with the dark multiverse Superman and the Paris Venom sideways kind of dude, that just feels like a detour from a detour. It feels like you're lost. The arc as a whole just feels incredibly lost. The annual, as the finale to this arc, it really does try to wrap as much as it can all in one go. Which isn't hard because what there is isn't very substantial. There are still a lot of good gags, a lot of good fuck yeah moments, exciting adventurous moments, but those are just punctuations through a morass of a lot of wasted potential. And of course, if you choose from man, he just exudes a comforting personality and I think that he is just very heroic. You lead off with him going off to trying to save the dark multiverse and that's fantastic and I think that he even says maybe next year we'll do this again and that's brilliant. I love that. That's just my favorite cliche and if this series does last another year, in fact I would be elated if all the annuals were just annual crossovers between Sideways and New 52 Superman. But yeah overall the issue itself it's okay. The arc, little bit disappointing, very lackluster. I'm just really glad that the series does live on and that we're going back to the mainline story because I think that there's so much to mine there. All right, moving on to Dead Rabbit number two. And this is on the upswing. Dead Rabbit is one of my favorite comics of the year. It is just so amazing. Duggan and McCree are brilliant. They are firing on all cylinders. They are doing everything I love in this sort of whacked out, slightly raunched, slightly vulgar but also incredibly heartfelt and momentously moody and just very pathos ridden series and story. I love it. This issue really does set the ball rolling for a lot of things 
that I really like as hallmarks of this genre where you have just the chaotic mess that is just looming in the near future and it just creates both like a very exciting humorous energy because I know that humorous is a weird word to say but when you have it like this or hitman or criminal or stray bullets or any of that kind of stuff the threat itself is just so dire that there is a black comedy to it you can't help but like feel like oh fuck <laughs> and laugh and chuckle a little bit and that's really what this sets down and i love it and it also does know how to juggle the tones it does know how to balance things out thankfully we have two masters here this issue has the most tear-jerking and depressive moments i've read in a while alongside just incredibly hilarious and off the wall sort of nonsense that i am just completely endeared by you have dead rabbit having this quiet like voiceless page where he is just in rage and in heartbreak and screaming screaming to the heavens in anger and pain and it's amazing it's just this great humanity moment and in the same issue you have him having to lug his partner in crime in a homeless man's <laughs> trash cart down an alleyway because he got too drunk and it's brilliant it's great i love it and this issue just doesn't fail to succeed on every possible level every time i read it i can't wait for number three and i'm just completely in love with this book so i really hope that other people are too all right, and so we head on into Border Town number three. Fuck this comic. I know, I know, I will get into this a little bit more, but I just want to say this comic is complete bullshit, and I can't believe I wasted money, like literal fucking money, on the first two issues. But I'm like, you know what? The first two issues, I want to support this kind of premise. I want to support, like, new voices in comics. It wants to do a kid gang story with Mexican culture, if Latin culture and Latin monsters and mythology. Fine, that's really cool. I'll pay for that. I want to just get my voice out there for that. First two issues, they have problems. They have problems that I could have forgiven because the first two issues also had a great sense in the direction of story. So yeah, while it did have like these things that I really do hate, I had to say, okay, so that's just them trying to get these things down. And even if it's a feature, the story at least is coming first. And that's way better than I've come to expect from this kind of stuff. Number three, yeah, that just fucking throws that out the window. I am honestly just so incensed and enraged by this issue. All right, so first things first. It still falls into some really obvious pitfalls. Like I mentioned, the first two issues, they all have the same flaws. The flaws carried over. But again, like, so the issue in the series, they know what story they want to tell. The story is coming first and the characters are reacting to the story, that shows that they wanted to treat this like an actual narrative. That's good. But no, it doesn't. The series would be so much better if it was trying to be a little bit more cynical or at least a little bit more self-aware about itself, but it doesn't. And the fact that it isn't self-aware, the fact that it, it does do so many things that are just so blind and so small-minded backfires hard, all right? A third issue just simply refuses to let anything about that coalesce, and instead it just doubles down on the most backhanded and the most, like, mind-numbingly stupid and honestly Honestly, ill thought out rhetoric. So one plot beat in this issue does get some development, does get some due, but the rest of this suffocates under insanely shoddy execution. Just to give an example, one thing about this issue is that it opens up with this prologue that has a page that extols the virtues and the nobility and the intelligence of our Latin ancestors and how fantastic and great they were before the bloody racist white Europeans came, right? And that it is racist to say that they didn't create their own temples and that aliens did it. A lot of people have rallied around this page because of that really base and the based writing, if you want to call it that. The next page right after that says that, all oh, right, but we also sacrifice children because, you know, why not? Everyone does it. And also aliens didn't build temples. Gods did. What the fuck? How does any of that make sense to you? Like, how does any of that make sense to write? If you're trying to make it out so that the Latin American people were this really hardy race, you can't just double down on this ridiculous bullshit because it adds to this really bad and insanely dissonant tract right here. You can't want to spread out the message that native Latin American people were very noble and very virtuous, almost saintly people because that's really what the first page of this issue is laying on incredibly thick and then go around and say like oh wait but we would kill children to appease our demon gods but it's okay because latin power everyone was doing it <laughs> we fucking really <laughs> really oh my god and it's ridiculous it really is because it's like issue number two where you have the chupacabra the chupacabra appeared in the first pages of issue one where he kills a mexican family and their little girl just eats them and in issue two is like oh wait it's a little cute teen pet 
And then this issue continues that thread of like, oh look, it's eating Cheeto. Let's nickname it El Cheeto Cabra. Fuck you. Because the treatment of Cheeto Cabra is how he treats Latin American people on a grander scale. All right. You can't have that as your message and then try and do like this ridiculous bullshit. If you want to portray Latin American people as like this very kind of noble and virtuous kind of people, go for it. Just go for it. All right. Or if you're trying to create some sort of intentional dissonance, then play on it. But they never do. The interaction between the kids and what the Bruja says, it's obviously meant to be so straightforward. And then you have the writer, who I've recently unfollowed on Twitter because I want to hear any more of his bullshit, said that, oh, thank God people are getting this, or thank God for getting our community visible. This is an unsubtle book for unsubtle times. Fuck you. All right. First of all, subtlety or unsubtlety, they each require craft and focus and if you want to get brownie points for showcasing our community then actually put some fucking effort into it and then the rest of the issue just never gets any better than that but the rest of the issue just suffers from incredibly face fronts and meandering rhetoric that is just so fucking boring the story just stops any sort of actual development or care about how these things work internally like i said the prologue could have worked if they wanted to showcase some sort of hypocrisy or if they wanted to make that the point but they don't they expect to be what it is but latin pride no no so yeah screw this issue and i'm dropping this book all right i really don't need this in my life and yeah i'm only talking about the prologue because that really is exemplified by everything else of it and the fact that the writer said that this is an unsettled book means that he obviously doesn't care about a story all he cares about is spouting out whatever bullshit he wants rather than actually telling a story so why even review the rest of this fucking book i can tell you straight off that it's not good the rest of it is just so bogged down every single piece of dialogue that comes out of these kids mouths is now focused on some sort of ideological tangent that doesn't propel anything forward so i am done i am done but yeah Moving on to something I really enjoyed, we have The Dreaming Number 3. Now, The Dreaming Number 3 is an issue that I actually enjoy bits and pieces of. It's not the strongest issue so far, but it is still incredibly entertaining. I think that this is something where Spurrier's habits are starting to overtake the narrative and the personality of the story a little bit. But I think that with the characters that they're playing with, including the old Jack Kirby and Joe Simon Sandman sidekicks, it adds a lot more leverage and weight to some of the things. It balances things out. I think that the character Gallows, he is imposing. He is a force. And there are panels and pages and layouts that Bill Quist heavily does that highlight that to the extreme. And it's fantastic. It sells it. It sells it hard and so the fact that the issue focuses on him and homes it on him and his thought processes and just the ripple effect he's having in the dreaming because he's now like an inquisitor it was the make and break of this issue doesn't disappoint we also get another great character moment from ziggy the blank soggy nothing that has been my favorite highlight of the series since issue one he is a legend i love him he gets this one brilliant moment in this issue that is fantastic and i didn't expect it it caught me by surprise and I was like, fuck yes, fuck yes, it's amazing. I started laughing, I, I died. And yeah, the issue doesn't turn out so well for Ziggy. But that just makes that aspect of it just hit so much harder because Ziggy doesn't deserve it. He's a nothing. He's innocent in that way. But still, Gallows, it only serves to really address just how far Gallows is willing to go. I still enjoy this series and I'm really, really happy with it. Can't wait for number four. Can't wait to see how or if these characters make it out of it. And let's head on into the Immortal Hulk number 8. After my disappointment of previous two issues for basically telling the same story and not doing anything interesting with that kind of premise or execution, this issue really does help to bring it somewhere closer to the original level of those first couple issues. I still don't think it's quite where it was yet, but it is definitely trying and I am just so glad that it's not trying to be complacent and it's not just being very apathetic about just being a trite or wrote cult comic. That was my worry. That was my worry with the previous two issues because it just felt like, okay, now we're just going through the motions of doing a random Hulk thing again. It still has a problem where this entire environment that the Hulk is mired in with the Avengers and with S.H.I.E.L.D. and with this entire conspiracy is just so uninteresting it really is like i just can't get my head around it and i am bored to tears by all of it but the hulk himself and how he's dealing with them that's what makes it really entertaining i think that the hulk is truly on form in this issue he definitely has like that very trash bastard personality i know i said it before but i love it that he will just look at someone and give them the shittiest eating grin ever it's great 
perfect button to to all the horrific things they've been through in this issue and when i saw that page when i saw that panel where he's like yeah i got you motherfucker i lost it i like yes hell yes and what happens after that is suitably horrific all right so he escapes because he's the hulk and he's gonna be able to fucking escape you know you can't contain the hulk and what he does next is like on a different level than the original issues because original first issues harken back a lot to that old 50s 60s style atomic age gothic this however seems to make a definite transition to 70s 80s body horror like cronenberg or even brian yusna carpenter style gore like it's the most grotesque thing i've ever seen a mainline hulk do there is some hints that this might be transitioning toward devil hulk which i can totally believe because this is like on that par and i just name checked like carpenter but joe bennett's art he does a different sort of transition between hulk and banner it is very much like one ripping out of the other and so when hulk transforms back to banner i can swear and i could probably put the two images side by side and i just might i just might for the youtube version of this episode that the banner's face is completely photo referenced from split face from the original thing so yeah that probably is it and it, it works so well it's a revolution because when you're taking hulk back to his horror roots and you stick with that horror lane it just feels a lot more fluid it feels a lot more natural and i just have more hope in this series going on right now i hope it's able to reach the first couple of issues level and next up we have the green lantern number one which is the first issue from grant morrison and liam sharp in their new first season of jordan's adventures and it's all right i found it kind of boring there are a lot of hooks for future plots in this series that are seeded out that i find really interesting but as an issue of itself it's, I don't know, it doesn't really do anything that gets me excited. The hooks are exciting, but the story content of the issue has some good moments here and there, but it's just nothing that I see is breaking the bank. I think that it's still a decent issue, but it's not something that I'm just so, so enamored and enraptured by. And I'm still really interested in seeing where it goes because a lot of those hooks are extremely exciting. So yeah, two middle thumbs, two middle thumbs. And last but not least, let's move on into Kick-Ass number 9. Honestly, it's still pretty entertaining. It still rides that line to destruction and just lots of mayhem. It's still very story-based and story-focused, which is nice. It's not really what I really expect or like really enjoy about this series, but it's handling that very well. And you add the extra little fantastic button near the end that I really hope that they explode into a bunch of complications and just ruinous intentions for this version of Kick-Ass because you can't be Kick-Ass about things just not going to plan at all, does it? And I love it. So yeah, good week for some comics, really horrible week for more. So hopefully next week will be better. Wait, no, Mr. Miracle number 12 is finally ending. So yes, by default, it'll be good because that horrible series is finally over. Can't wait for that. Anyway, let's move on into what I watched this week. And as always, it is Titans. This episode, like I mentioned last week, was a very make or break episode because it focuses on the entire team together for the first time at last. And I have to say, it is probably my least favorite episode so far, but it's still not that bad. I think that all the episodes, including this one, are at the very least decent. It just doesn't have any of the highs that the other episodes do have and it just feels very middling. There's nothing really on display here that gets to any sort of climax. It's not bad. I think that of course some of the character ones are still really entertaining. Raven is still very entertaining. Beast Boy has some really funny moments. He feels like something out of Mystery Man in this episode and it's fantastic. But the episode as a whole, where the story goes, how the story is portrayed, how it's directed, it doesn't have that same sort of energy and you can feel it. It's very short. It's like the shortest episode I've seen so far with only like 38 minutes. And the training segment in of itself is very just in name only. All they do is display their powers and then that's it. And the rest is just them kind of talking. And it works in a character focused sort of way, but it's just them talking to each other for an extended period of time. It's nothing on the level of the first couple of episodes where the character development happens and they're talking, but it's also part of this grander sort of set piece. And that's not really the case here. It feels very small, very confined. It's a very bottle episode. And like I said, it's decent, but it's just not on that same kind of entertainment value level. But I really can't wait for the next episode because that's introduction to Jason Todd. He appears in like the very finale of this one and he looks really really fun and affable and the preview for the next episode shows that there might be some really nice dynamic moments with him and Robin, I mean Dick. So yeah, I'm excited for that one. This one, 
one, it's a good stop gap. I guess that not everything can be on the same sort of high. And if you're trying to go for a long haul series, you need to have like these slower paced episodes to fill it out with. So yeah, still pretty good, but there's really not much to dig into like the other ones had. Anyway, that's it. We have only one listener question this week and it comes from The Great Illuminated. I will, of course, post all of their links below. And I just want to remind everyone that Damn Comics premieres next week. I will review that on this show. I will post the link below next episode. And I really hope that you check it out. It is well worth the time. It looks fantastic. Illuminated has been posting on our social media little reminders of the day countdown featuring Hop and the main character of Now, which have been really, really fun and just very energetic and very, very cute and hilarious. So I really recommend it. Like seriously, go check it out. But their question for this week is, given my current love for Dead Rabbit, what do I think makes for a good crime series? And what works in the genre do you most like? Yeah, I guess I mentioned somewhat of this back in my review for Dead Rabbit number two. But what I most enjoy in a crime series is just like that very hard-lined cynical edge to it. And the perfect examples of that would be like the ones I mentioned, like Criminal or Stray Bullets or like Hitman or even that kind of area. Because you have the straight-laced execution of, say, the crime, but it never really is portrayed like so straightforward it's portrayed with a very knowing and self-aware side to it where it knows like the way it's presenting it wouldn't really be the way it happens it's very much focusing in on the mythology and the kind of like cult of personality around criminal activity in order to create this hyper reality around the story like you have something like fargo fargo is presented as a dramatization of things that really happened the original movie i mean and so it has all these very colorful and odd things about it but you're sort of accepting it then you understand more about it because it's working on such really overemphasized basic tropes and just the whole coalescing of all these attributes that culminate in this really chaotic stew that's what i really enjoy i'm not saying that works for every single crime comic around like you have something like road to perdition road to perdition is a really fantastic crime story i love it and it's very classically told it doesn't have this double-handed angle to it it's very straightforward but it's so lovingly and masterfully conveyed to the reader that i can look away sometimes So yeah, you do have like examples of either this or that. And I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but I guess it's because of this versatility. What really does make for a good crime comic, like in general, is that you have a lot of passion for it. Like you do want to be able to tell this story in as like heartfelt a way as possible. You want to have that heart in it, even if it's something that is meant to just totally break you down or like be so depressing. You want to have that passion. You want to showcase just like this other side of a world you might not or never ever encountered. I guess like to just highlight this, you could go back into like the original crime comics, the golden age of crime comics, like crime suspense stories or crime shock stories, the old EC brand. They showcased a lot of this same stuff and maybe even a melded it too because they wanted to tell like straighter crime stories here and there. But then you would also get like some really, really off color stuff like the original episodes of Tales from the Crypt adapted, I think, a crime suspense story story that was about the killer Santa Claus mental patient escapee. So you have this and that. And I'm guessing you just want to have that energy. You want to have that passion. You want to have just a good sense of what audience you're catering to. If you want to do something a little more straightforward and in terms of the crime story, then yeah, you want to have just the same coordinated balance you want something that is going to break some rules break some boundaries here and there then you have to be aware that you're going to be making something that if you are too strict about yourself if you don't have a direct sense of self-awareness about what you're writing then you're going to fumble and you don't want to fumble either way so yeah that is as much as i can really delve into with what i think makes it for a good crime comic it's less about like the actual events of the crime itself but really what your intent is and for my favorite crime comics i think i already mentioned them over and over again just by using them as examples i really do enjoy most of criminal and you know stray bullets a lot of David Latham's work. I do love the old DC comics. And of course, I do still get from time to time a nice scintillating sense of adventure and just entertainment from stuff like Sin City and so on. So, you know, it's here nor there. I really enjoy them. And with Dead Rabbit, I am more than 
confident we'll be able to join those same ranks if it is able to keep a steady and sharp course for itself. And there's nothing that is telling me that I won't be able to do that. And I guess one last thing I want to bring up is that I trotted out this paraphrase quote before, but something about what Sam Raimi said about how sometimes you want to see the karma play out is that you want to see sometimes, not all the time, because like I said, there's so many moods and tones, but sometimes you want to see the motherfuckers get wasted at the end or just consequences and the reappraisals and retribution just come full circle because like who doesn't want to see that sometimes he doesn't want to get like a reaffirmed sense of like justice or the world or to just mention Futurama where everyone gets $300 and Bender steals a cigar and goes throughout the entire episode not getting any kind of comeuppance for that at the very end he gets attacked by the cops out of nowhere he's like yay closure I think that's also a very very intricate part about crime comics that sometimes people might miss out on anyway thank you for that question illuminated i hope that answer made any lick of sense i am so grateful for your question and just for all the work you do it's fantastic and i really can't wait to see and hopefully spread the word and support your various ventures because they are truly truly amazing you're a talented and fantastic individual thank you so much for that and thank you for everyone who sends in questions comments feedback it means so much i am truly humbled by it and i'm so so grateful if anyone out there has their own questions comments or topics they want to hear or discuss on the show you can find me on twitter at t-h-e underscore s-n-i-c-k-m-a-n and i want to give a special shout out to the cover artist for this series at d-o-t-e-m-c-e-e they do fantastic work and i'm so so over the moon about the cover art all right so see you next week hope you have some good reading and i'll be back again with more reviews and so on have a good one